Hello everyone, my name is Mariela Machado and I'm Program Manager with the Engineering for Global Development team here at ASME. The COVID crisis introduced a new hurdle in the journey towards achieving the SDGs by 2030. It also forced the global development community to consider what we were planning to do differently in this decade of action to actually ensure the delivery in the con context of future crises such as climate change. And what are the opportunities and, and are for the engineering community as a part of this international mobilization for the SDGs? Today, we have assembled a panel representing cross-cutting stakeholders in global development to share their experience with crisis and recommendations for how to stay the course under extreme circumstances as the ones uh, we're living in now. We will hear from an UN agency with boots on the ground, an infrastructure firm delivering solutions for resiliency and lessons learned from regional responses in Kenya and South Korea. Our panel will be immediately followed by a spotlight on the COVID-19 response executed by the UN's Economic Commission for Africa and their unique approach for driving innovation and investment across the continent. To start off the discussion, I would like to invite our moderator, Ariel Alek Aleksovich, and I hope I said that right, Ariel, who is a Sustainable Development Officer at UNDESA and at the forefront of the monitoring, evaluation, and strategic efforts for the 2030 Agenda. Ariel, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome and over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Mariella, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this panel, Ecosystems for Social Impact. My name is Ariel Aleksevich, and I'm a Sustainable Development Officer at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, based in New York. As the think tank of the UN, our department generates, analyzes, and compiles a wide range of economic, social, and environmental data and statistics to inform and advise UN member states and other stakeholders as they take stock of trends and policy options to tackle common problems. Of course, this year, our work is focused on the economic and social challenges related to COVID and how we can recover better from the pandemic. Our department also acts as the Secretariat for the Sustainable Development Goals, providing substantive support and capacity building for the 17 goals and their, and their related thematic issues, including water, energy, climate, oceans, urbanization, transport, science, and technology. We play a key role in the evaluation of UN system-wide implementation of the 2030 Agenda and on partnership, advocacy, and outreach activities relating to the SDGs. So thank you very much to my colleague Astra, who just gave an overview about what DESA is doing to engage scientists, innovators, and people in tech in the implementation of the SDGs. You are very welcome to follow our Science, Technology, and Innovation Forum in 2021 and also contribute to the 2030 Connect platform that Astra mentioned, which aims to bring together global entrepreneurs, innovators, students, and others seeking to exchange ideas and build networks to help SDG implementation. You can find the platform by Googling 2030 Connect, or I'll give you the URL here, it's tfm2030connect.un.org. So the UN does this work of engaging with the tech community because achieving the SDGs by 2030 is something we can only do by working together. Everyone has a role to play, federal governments, local governments, the private sector, civil society, international organizations, academia, youth, individuals, and engineers. So we have to, with us today four amazing panelists to share with us some innovations helping the world recover better from COVID and make progress on the SDGs. We have Siddharth Chatterjee, the UN Resident Coordinator for Kenya. Um, we have Rebecca Moreno Jimenez, Innovation Officer and Data Scientist at UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. We have Myung Hua Lee, Research Fellow and Head of the Office of National R&D at the Research Science and Technology Policy Institute in South Korea and Michael McWhorter, Vice President of Stantec, here to talk about some private sector initiatives. So as you can see, we have four smart and accomplished guests here in only 25 minutes to hear from them. We won't have much time for Q&A, but if you have a question, please type it into the chat. If nothing else, we'll share them with the panelists and get their responses so they can be incorporated into the final document for this event. So let's dive right in. 
All right, with our all-star lineup here representing governments, the private sector, and different parts of the UN, I would love to hear from each of you about how you or your organizations are using science, technology, and innovation to aid the COVID efforts where you are. So maybe let's hear from Sid first. What are you seeing on the ground in Africa? To me, thank you for that question. And to me, Africa in many ways epitomizes what the future market looks like. By 2050, this is a continent which will have 2.3 billion people of which 850 million will be young people. So it is going to be a market of consumers and producers, but how do we get them there? So the SDGs to me is the roadmap of the Africa's Marshall Plan. And that can only happen when we actually see the advent of true convergences of big data technology and innovation. So let me just give you a little story, which is I think pertinent and very germane to this conversation. Back in 2014, I used to be the head of the UN Population Fund, and there were six counties of the 47 counties in Kenya, which had the highest maternal mortality ratios in, the, in, in Kenya, but as a result of which, Kenya got held back in achieving, if you recall, the Millennium Development Goal number five, which was about ensuring that there was 170 deaths per 100,000 live births or lower. But, but in Kenya's case, that wasn't the case. So we decided to go in there into a public-private partnership. So Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, Philips, Safaricom, Huawei, and Kenya Healthcare Federation joined up with us, UNFPA, UNICEF, and, and WHO. And in a matter of two and a half years, we were able to actually impact the maternal mortality ratios in these six counties, which got us invited to the World Economic Forum in 2017 in January. And that's when we realized that look, if we could actually come together and have such an impact in a micro setting, which is very fragile, very insecure, uh, you know, the infrastructure was very weak. Why can't we look at universal health coverage as, a, as an opportunity to undertake in Kenya? And which then in 2017, we set up the first SDG public-private partnership platform during the UN General Assembly, led by the foreign minister of Kenya, and several companies, the UN came together and formed this platform. What we have done ever since is really expanded this platform to include health, affordable housing, agriculture, manufacturing. The aim being that we use as an underlying big data technology and innovation to leapfrog the SDGs. And more recently, we went to the Silicon Valley, this was in January, to bridge the Silicon Savannah here in Kenya with the Silicon Valley companies in, in, in the Silicon Valley. And it's clear that Kenya in many ways is actually at the forefront of many innovations, whether during the COVID you've seen a student body, which the UN recognized as the students of the year, the UN people of the year because of creating ventilators or the kind of, it's really the hotbed of, 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 of a variety of, of innovation. So today our platform, what we are trying to do through that is drive this innovation, is drive this acceleration that we need. Because if you remember what the Deputy Secretary General Amina Muhammad often reminds us, she says we have to flip the orthodoxy. And the way you flip the orthodoxy is a new convergence of partners. And therefore, you know, I want to applaud uh, ACME for their, you know, for their leadership and for having kind of pulled this whole event together and quite clearly listening to Asha's message, I think that is precisely what we echo here out in the field. And that's the only way we will be able to propel that discourse and change that narrative, which actually besets Africa as mission impossible. Actually, Africa is where the new paradigm is going to happen. Over to you, Aria. Thanks, Sid. Africa certainly is the full of opportunities right now. And I, I hope that everyone hears your words right now and um, is excited and sees the possibilities there. So let's just shift geographic focus and ask. Uh, let me ask Myung-Hwa, what are you seeing in South Korea? Uh, Asia, of course, has been a place where the worst effects of COVID have already been minimized to a large degree, but um, how, how are you or your organization using tech, science, innovation to aid the COVID efforts? Um, thank you, Ariel. Um, I'm happy to share Korea's experience. In Korea, uh, science and technology played a critical role in quite successfully responding to COVID-19. 
Uh, for example, as soon as the first confirmed case was reported in Korea, the government tried to develop diagnostic kits for massive scale tests. In order to do this, uh, AI technologies have been used for developing, um, yeah, identifying the genetic nature of the virus. Uh, so that uh, contributed to developing test kits uh, quickly. Uh, also, Korea utilized the smart city uh, technologies to identify uh, suspected patients in a very short time. The locations of confirmed patients are identified by uh, using the details of their credit card transactions uh, surveillance uh, camera footage and GPS tracking of mobile phones. Uh, now Korea has uh, focused on developing vaccines and therapeutics to uh, deal with COVID-19. And some corona therapeutics are in phase three of uh, clinical trials. As we have seen in this crisis, I believe that uh, the role of science and technology will become greater in uh, resolving uh, social challenges. Yes, uh, over uh, over to you, Ariel. Great, thanks, Myunghwa. That's uh, it's really great what we're hearing coming out of Korea. So thank you for presenting that information. So let me shift to Rebecca and ask what what's going on with UNHCR and dealing with COVID in refugee camps. Thank you, Ariel, for the question, and thank you, Punk Engineer, for the opportunity to speak on this panel. And as you probably know, uh, refugees and other displaced populations are some of the most marginalized and most vulnerable members of society. And now with COVID-19, they are particularly at risk um, because uh, they often have limited or actually lack of uh, basic things like water or hygiene items like soap or access to sanitation systems or health facilities, right? And so it goes beyond camps, right? So as 80% of our world's refugee population and nearly all the world's internally displaced people are hosted in low and middle income countries. Majority of them, they live in, in urban crowded areas as well. So they're also at risk. And in the sense, UNHCR efforts at a global level has being focused to help first, forcibly displaced, to providing with these life-saving items to support them, for example, access to water in, the, in some of the camps precisely, medical care, PPE or hygiene materials, and also expanding cash assistance to help mitigate the pandemic negative socioeconomic impact. But in, again, like the agency has double redouble efforts on the protection front, uh, by improving community network communication and fact-based information. There's a lot of misinformation around COVID-19, particularly in, in, in forcibly displaced communities, as well as becoming a strong advocate to respond to sexual and gender-based violence and child trafficking that have increased dramatically since the onset of COVID-19. But as your particular question on, on science, technology, and innovation on COVID-19, well, we as UNHCI Innovation Service, uh, partner up with UN Global Pulse, uh, which is the UN Secretary General Initiative for Big Data and AI, OCHA, Durham University, and IBM MIT Watson AI Lab to create a computer simulation to understand the spread of COVID-19 in Kutapalong expansion site in Cox's Bazaar Cox in Bangladesh. So in the camp, in the camp expansion site. And the simulation uses a agent-based modeling approach, um, which is aiming to understand the movement of people within the camp and provide insights around this movement for the potential spread. And derived from this movement, uh, the camp management team can make informed decisions. For example, uh, which ones are the best health measures to be taking according to the movement, like closure of the schools or closure of certain areas of shops or communal areas, or where to use more strongly the use of masks, right? I think um, the, the camp team it will be benefiting from this uh, simulation, which is already being tested with them, uh, because they can make decisions after that evidence that we're giving, which is the spread of, of modeling the, the spread. And if you're interested to know more about this project, there's a blog that is out already in the Google Pulse website, and the research paper is coming soon for those engineers interested. Over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. That is a really cool initiative. Data is power, as our engineering audience out here knows for sure. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
Um, let, let me turn to Michael. How, how about what Stantec is doing? What are you seeing in your work? Yeah, hi, and uh, thank you, as everyone else has said, for the opportunity. Um, I think kind of reflecting on hearing what folks said there and also looking across our portfolio of things that we've been involved with, really COVID has touched everything that we do um, as communities. And kind of I was going through, you know, Stantec has it on our website, we have um, you know, a list of projects we've been involved with that, that have looked at this and, and the breadth of what technology and issues we've had to look at are, are really broad. Um, you know, some data analysis things have really needed to be done to understand how transportation systems um, are changing with everybody's very, very different um, activities now, uh, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, good utilities also need to think forward and, and consider what will that will look like in the future as well after the pandemic, likely um, some significant changes there. Um, a lot of what we've done has been trying to help businesses to continue to operate uh, well. Um, you know, some of the largest hit sectors have been, you know, hospitality, uh, restaurants and, and things like that. And, and a really large part of what we've been doing in sort of the areas of landscape, uh, architecture and you know, architecture itself have been associated with trying to redesign the places where you know, humans meet so that they are inherently safer with better, um, uh, you know, more warmth, because as it gets cold, like we, you know, the, the warmth becomes a challenge. Um, and also, you know, a bit of ventilation externally, often naturally, so that, uh, you know, locations are just uh, safer for people to have dinner or, and, and do things like that in a way that, you know, is uh, respectful of the challenges that the pandemic has. And then there's been some, um, you know, very um, important work done with the ventilation inside buildings well. You know, HVAC has become a really important thing and redesigning of basically every type of building um, to try and address this. And I think that's been a, a common trend in pandemics over through history, that that's been a real real key thing. And then some things that maybe you wouldn't think about, there's a lot of work has been done. Um, Santex heavily involved with some of our clients tracking, uh, using wastewater sampling to sort of uh, get a, a forethought or, as to where the uh, virus might be more prominent and things like that. So if you look at this, it's, it's really touched every part of our life um, in every community that we work and serve in. And so because of that, like there's had to be such a broad uh, application of technology and science to really address it. Thank you, Michael. Certainly in the COVID era, any efforts towards improving sanitation are well received. So thank you for sharing that. So everybody, thanks for laying a great groundwork here. And let me ask you guys, what do you need from clients, from donors, governments, technology itself to improve these efforts to make sure that we're reaching everybody? And maybe I could invite Sid to take a stab first, please. So perhaps the, you know, the sustainable development goals itself issues a clarion call to the entire world of leaving no one behind. And therefore, Sustainable Development Goal 17 becomes even more relevant in this era or, or should we call this decade of action to achieve the SDGs. So in a sense, this new public-private partnership model that the UN actually generated here in Kenya is now being seen by many UN country teams as a global norm of advancing the SDG 17 agenda in order to look at real value propositions of, and this is not about Ariel about philanthropy or, or charity. No, it's about real programs that impact lives and are sustainable at the same time. And that is why what we need is what I call the harnessing of big data technology and innovation to look at this, this gigantic shift in the way we need to advance the entire growth and advancement of Africa, particularly which I'm interested in, in terms of the sustainable development goals. Over to you. Yeah, um, I think that that really shows that we need more partnerships that can also uh, connect everybody together to to improve these efforts. Maybe I'll ask Rebecca from the refugee side uh, and what can happen more to to reach these vulnerable people. Thank you. Well, first, to, to keep up with the continued support and partnerships to tackle now what we call the double challenge now for displacement as a challenge um, and the global pandemic as well as a challenge. Um, now, more than ever, I think we need the interdisciplinary approach uh, to solve global problems now. 
uh, I think as the project, as I mentioned, uh, in this project, we have social scientists, public health specialists, epidemiologists, computer scientists, data engineers, and education and shelter specialists just to design that simulation. And it, it, it's just a computer simulation. It's just one problem and one project. But that could actually lay the ground on a lot of more complex solutions that we can help those who are forcibly displaced in camps, in urban areas, wherever they are located. Uh, and then also we welcome those efforts, especially those who are focused on social impact, that they have this interdisciplinary approach and that they're human centered based. Because I'm amazed sometimes how people design projects for refugees and internally displaced people without ever interviewing them or having any contact with them, right? So I think we need all those people that are working on solutions besides um, governments or technologies or even engineers to have that particular emphasis on on that and precisely just as a final point i think also for for donors for the technology sector in general uh, to use responsible data practices um such as data protection privacy by design as well as a very strong focus on human rights and ethics uh, to develop any technology solution because with this human-centered approach that i was mentioning like trying to talk to those people that are affected but also this approach on on, on responsible data practices and human rights we make sure that all these efforts are accessible to everyone and respecting their human rights and, and, and obviously dignity and humanity. Thank you, over to you, Ari. Thanks, Rebecca, that's so important. Humans, humans first, people first in policies and when um, thinking about next steps and solutions. So let me ask um, Myung Hua, um, in your opinion, how can scientists and engineers be better utilized to ensure that each country recover better after COVID-19? You know, of course, ensuring the social and environmental protections and putting us on a good path as we continue down this decade of action for SDGs. Um, thank you, Ariel. Uh, let me share a recent initiative which was established in Korea. Uh, last July, the government announced the Korean New Deal initiative, which uh, includes the Green New Deal. Uh, we set amb ambitious goals to move toward a net zero society and a number of bold SDI uh, strategies. The projects are, for example, uh, green industrial complexes, green remodeling, green energy, and eco-friendly mobility of the future. Uh, scientists and engineers will play a significant role in developing renewable energy equipment, smart grids for more efficient energy management and electric and hydrogen cars. I think Korea's current initiative will perfectly fit into uh, the SDGs. Yes, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Myung Hwa. I think this uh, sounds really cool and exciting that Korea is, is framing it this way. Um, it's recovery. It kind of reminds me, our UN Secretary General has talked about something called a new social contract that is trying to integrate employment, sustainable development, and social protection. So it's great to see um, a government uh, stepping up to take that on. Um, so let me go to Michael. Um, Michael, how do you think engineers and scientists can be better utilized in these efforts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, something that struck you know, me personally and, and us as a company at the start of this was, was the speed of what had to happen. And I think there's been a lot of examples of that. You know, the, the great developments with vaccines is something that I think everybody in the world is excited about. Um, and, and, but speed has been really important. Adaptability, it was a challenge that literally, I mean, we were all sitting there thinking about what February was like and we had no idea uh, what was gonna happen, um, you know, what was happening at that time and, and how our lives were gonna change so quickly. And I think in you know, many situations, this, you know, we were able to respond as a, as a species even very quickly um, to that. You know, we had, um, I was looking back on some work that, that we did like, you know, there were hospitals that needed to instantly change. Um, and, you know, we had design teams that worked on things like that and, and made those changes literally in, in, in hours uh, to, for designs, things that we might have thought about for, for weeks and months before. So I think that, that speed is really important. I think we have many, um, you know, technologies, obviously, which support that now. And I think to answer the, the question, so we have these challenges that come to us. We have challenges right now that come to us. What can we do best with science? Like, it's about really quickly sharing the great ideas that we have. 
part of innovation is um, you know a good idea that turns up in one place. We need to get that everywhere. And I think you know people who uh, work as engineers and scientists and things like that, we we have networks and using those networks and the technology that's available to us, we can share quickly ideas that are solutions and. You know, around the world, it's been proven that, that science and technology and, and a following of, of what they tell us is really the, the key to, to beating coronavirus. And uh, I think if we keep that up with our personal networks and make use of what's there and quickly share information, that, that is what we can do to best uh, create impact. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. I mean, looking ahead to 2021, the hot topic will inevitably be COVID-19 vaccine rollout. So thank you for touching on that. Um, Scientists put down a big challenge for engineers with a lot of these vaccines needing cold storage and mass distribution. So thanks for telling us that speed is uh, what we need. And, uh, you know, we need all these engineers working towards this effort. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have. I would like to thank our panelists again for the insights that they've shared today. If you would like to learn more about the sustainable development goals and ways for your organization to be more involved or you individually, please visit sdgs.un.org. Thank you very, very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>